very good evening friends meeting again in the session of philosophy and we are discussing the sixth chapter from the h a roberts philosophy the homeopathy and the fundamental principle in this chapter he tried to explain how the homeopathic principles why they are fundamental why they are scientific and he explained the reason to start with the chapter if any principle which you have derived has a exist its existence with the principles of the nature if they had have a existence with the principles of the basic sciences and then and then only you can call them as a basic principles or fundamental principles and then he explained how this nature's law of cure or law of similars was derived by hanuman that is the first thing which he has explained over there so he explained that it is a part and parcel of experimentation with which the law of similars came into existence it is not someone felt like that and then he he developed or discussed that law it was first hanuman saw or experienced over that it then he experimented same law with himself and then he came to the conclusion there might be some relationship and then he experimented nearly about 6 years with different different ingredients which have medicinal properties and then after experimentation when he found the truth then he explained the law of similars in front of the world in the similar manner he has explained the, there was one more law which was explained by hering which is again a part and parcel of or truth or observation and that is called as herring's law of direction of cure the cure must takes place from above downwards within outward from center to periphery from the organs of greater importance to the organs of lesser importance and in the reverse order of appearance of symptoms so all the laws these laws are the part and parcel of experimentation with which they were derived and if one follows that it indicates that you are on the path of cure if it goes against we can say that the path is wrong it means the remedy selected is not proper it is wrong so these are the laws which are derived and which are part and parcel of the fundamental law then we can say yes this is these are the laws which are definitely fundamental they are natural and that's what we have finished in last lecture that is simple disappearance of symptom is by no means cure symptoms often have periods of recurrence but no true cure has been observed that did not follow the law of direction and this thing which he, <clears throat> which he is mentioning if we are damn sure about our law we can base our prognosis upon that if the if the cure happens according to the herring's law of direction of cure then we are damn sure yes whatever is happening is correct and then he explains that how these two laws or how these laws are in correlation with the laws of basic sciences so we'll go in with the next paragraph on page number 58 the chap paragraph number 5 another law equally applicable throughout the universe is that called as a law of mutual action actions and reactions are equal and opposite which is also called as newton's third law of motion the same law is also called as law of mutual action or law of reciprocal action whole homeopathy revolves around this law everything revolves around this law just consider where this is applicable first important thing consider that oh, how a decisive something happens in your economy externally to which your body your mind your vital force reacts so some there is some action from outside to which you have reacted and if your reaction is abnormal it produces a disorder so in the development of the disorder the law of mutual action works same is true in the maintenance of the health the law of mutual action also works because there is something happens you react to the situation and if it is fact and reaction and they are equal and opposite you maintain the balance until the balance is there you are healthy you are not no more support but if the reactions are unequal unproportional then a disease happens 
But how this has happened? This has happened on the basis of law of mutual action. There was some action and reaction from the vital force. Now we'll consider how we do the proving. We do the proving on the same basis. We give a remedy to the patient for the proving. Uh, for, uh, we give remedy to the prover for the proving. We give not a material medicine, but a dynamic medicine. So it is nothing but a stimulus given to the human being. A human vital force react to that stimulus. Action and reactions are equal and opposite and proving happens. He reacts with certain signs and symptoms. We record those. So we get a proving again on the basis of law of mutual action. Then we apply the same remedy on the basis of symptom similarity to the patient who is suffering from the similar types of symptoms. We give that remedy to the patient. Again, the law of mutual action works. Your remedy, which is given in dynamic doses, produces its action. Your vital force, which was in disease state, reacts to it and it, re it gets released. So again, a law of mutual action works. So, whole homeopathy revolves around this specific law, which is not the law of specifically of homeopathy, which, but which is the law of basic sciences. It is the law of physics. So, everywhere in the universe, this law is applicable and this law is go in, in corollary with the homeopathic laws. And that's why we define the nature's law of cure. We define the law of similar. And both are based upon this specific law, which is called as law of mutual action or law of mm, reciprocal action. So these, these things we must know. If there are students in the session, this law is asked for MCQ, law of reciprocal action. You have to write only these words, action and reactions are equal and opposite. They, three names are there for this law, law of reciprocal action, law of mutual action, or it is also called as Newton's third law of motion. So, it is two marks question for them. To some of us, we have thoughtfully considered these things. They seem so self-evident that it would be almost unnecessary to speak of them. Were it not for the purpose of urging you to observe the lawfulness of homeopathy and to prove our claim for, of the fundamental lawfulness of this true science of healing. Let us look at the law which follows naturally the law of mutual action. So, this law is applicable in all those processes. Just now I have told, it is applicable in the state of health, it is applicable in the state of disease, it is applicable in the state of recovery, it is applicable in the state of cure. Everywhere, this law is applicable. So, law of mutual action and law of nature's law of cure, they go hand in hand. The law of cure, law of Mm, uh, reciprocal action or this this one mutual action goes hand in hand with the definition of homeopathy. So both of them are dependent upon each other and that's why they are called to be a very clear cut indication of the fundamental law. This is, law, this is the law designated as the law of least action which is formed, which was formulated by Moper and French, the French mathematician. To us, as homeopathic physician and students, it may be known as the law of quantity and dose. So there was another law, which is law of mathematics rela related with the quantity, law of quantity. It is called as a, or it is also called as law of least action or law of quantity. What is that law? The quantity necessary for action the quantity of action necessary to effect any change in the nature is least possible. The decisive amount is always a minimum as an infinite symbol. This is the law. This is again an MCQ, what is called to be a law of least action or law of quantity. This is the law of physics, law of mathematics. It is not law of homeopathy. But we have law of minimum dose in our pathy. And what is that? The dose should be so minimum so as to arouse the vitality in a deceased individual. It's called as law of minimum dose. This is the law which is again based upon same law. Same law. This is the same law which is based upon this law of physics and mathematics. So, we can say that law of minimum dose is again the law which is derived from the physical 
law of physics and mathematics. So our law is a fundamental law. He is giving the proofs. He is explaining the proofs how our laws they are basic and fundamental. They are related to the laws of science, and that's why we can definitely rely upon all those. Health is a matter of perfect equilibrium, perfect balance, tripling circumstances, miss we eat, and even an even as seemingly tripling circumstances, miss we eat. So. May it be balanced by least possible in medication, which may in con condition of perfect health cause same loss of balance or cor corresponding loss of equilibrium. So see, he is explaining again how this law of least action works in your life. See, yourself, you are healthy and something happens in your life, you never get a proper diet. Actually, the quantity necessary for um, maintaining the equilibrium regarding the minerals is so minute, but still it maintains the health. What happens sometimes, you, you never get the desired thing. For example, we'll take into consideration, you never get the vitamin D, which is prepared from the sun rays. And there is, you cannot get the sun rays for a period of one month or two months. How much quantity of vitamin D is necessary? It is so minute, but still it affects and your bones become, starts becoming porous. You get a porous bones, osteoporosis. So, minutest quantity is sufficient for maintaining the health. So, law of quantity works in the state of health. Same is true for the iron, same is true for the zinc, same is true for every element. It, it is required in so minute quantity, but still that is required. If it is not maintained, it affects the state of health and a disease development. So same law is applicable that the quantity of action necessary to effect any change in the nature is the least possible. So this law is applicable in the state of health. Another law of quantity to be considered here is the, the quantity of drug required in the inverse ratio to the similarity. In other words, the greater the similarity, the drug symptoms to those of patient, the less quantity will be required and for the greater will be the state of susceptibility of the patient. So another law he, he has derived from the same. There is a question that if there is a... Um, what he is saying, the quantity of the drug required is an is in an inverse ratio to the similarity. If similarity is very perfect, there is very least quantity of medicine is required because the susceptibility is always high. You get a, so many symptoms, so many um, futures, and patient is in a higher susceptible state. And if patient is in a higher susceptible state, your body reacts. So it is. It reacts to the sm smallest stimulus. So quantity necessary is always least possible. It is inverse ratio. Higher the susceptibility, lower is the medicine required. Quantity of medicine means higher the susceptibility, higher the potency. Potency means quantity is less. So it is inversely proportional to the disease. Very very clear. We should have a clear cut thoughts in our mind regarding the potency. So if susceptibility is high, if the symptoms are more marked, you should give the higher potency, but very less repetition. Le high potency doesn't mean high quantity. High potency means less quantity. The corollary to the law of quantity is the qu quality of action is of a homeopathic remedy is determined by its quantity in inverse ratio. Again, this is a problem of susceptibility of the patient and similarity of the drug. The laws of quality and quantity goes hand in hand. So see, this is very important law, which again he is mentioning. The quality of the action of a homeopathic remedy is determined by its quantity in the reinverse ratio. So if your remedy is well-proved remedy, and if you have got very clear-cut case, Patient's susceptibility is too high. Patient has narrated many symptoms and your remedy is a very perfect remedy for the case. So here, 
the quality which you have to use is high. Quality is high means your potency should be high. But quantity is necessary is very less. So you give a 1M or 10M potency in a single dose or one or two dose or three dose, not more than that. So you, you will require higher quality, lesser quantity, inversely proportion. If quality is high, the quantity should be very less. So again, it depends upon the nature's existence, law of least quantity. So these are the laws which are there. We used to use in homeopathy. They are part and parcel of nature's laws. They are part and parcel of basic sciences laws. And that's why we have all the proofs why it should be less in quantity, why it should be high in quality. Everything depends upon all those basic things. And then he says, biology uses this law this is called as a law of biological development. See, all those laws, you write it over there, those who are the students, write over there, these are laws for MCQs. It, it is so simple. These are the only six words. Functions, creates an organ and develops the organs. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six words are there. Function creates and develops the organ. This is the law of biological development. Unique law. This is not, not a law of homeopathy, basically. This is the law which is derived in biology and it has been derived by, by the biological science depending upon observation. What it means? It means that whenever the fertilization happens, an embryo develops, it is made up of a single similar cell. Then vital principle enters inside which governs that and then it starts duplicating, it starts dividing and increasing in size, the development starts. Then cells are dividing, there is a development which is going on and then this vital pr principle defines a pr specific function. It defines that to the certain cells, yes, you work for the brain, Another cell, you work for the eyes. Another cell, it tells you work for the nose. You work for the ears. You work for the tongue. So every function is defined first. Then same cells gets converted into the separate cell. Ultimately, they are the products of the same cell, but they are they changes according to it, and that's why the law develops. The functions creates the and develops the organ. So, for functions are defined, which creates the organ. You can define it in three words. Functions creates organs. That is a simple word. Uh, three words law. So, functions are first defined and then it creates the organ. And this law, what it indicates? It indicates your development is from center to periphery. It is defined in the center and then peripherally it develops and develops the organ. Then the head is developed, the extremities are developed, then the trunk is developed, then the, every organ is developed, then de de there is a development of different systems inside you. This is right from center. So human develops right from center. It develops on the law of biological development. So growth is from center to periphery. In the similar manner, if the disease has to develop, it also works in the similar manner. So he tries, now he explains, it has observed in the study of homeopathy that function symptoms are produced by the vital force in exact proportion to the profundity of the disturbance. Often, however, when pathological changes occur, the symptomatic picture changes greatly in that function of symptom, do not manifest themselves in as a great degree. The disease condition has struck deeper and manifest itself less on the surface. Following the biological law, therefore, homeopathy postulates this law of symptom development, function symptoms precede the structural change. So there is a law of biological development, functions creates the organ. And there is a law which is developed in homeopathy on basic, based upon the same law that function symptoms, functional symptoms precede the structural change. What it means? A simple example will take. Patient starts getting the headache. It has, it has started 
he got the headache on day one. He goes to the medical store, takes some tablet. He feels better for some time. Then he starts getting it again and again. And then he went to doctor. Doctor examines. He says nothing wrong. Then he, he prescribes a course for a 10 days. Patient consumes that. He felt better for 15 days. Then again, patient started getting it. Then he was labeled that you might have a migraine. So he again prescribed some medicine, but it was not settling. It started recurring again and again. And then patient asked that doctor, is there any problem? And doctor says, you go for better for the MRI. We'll do the MRI of brain. MRI is done and nothing is found. Because disease was in a functional state. It was disturbing the function. What is the functional disorder? Functional disorder means a disorder where functions get affected. So whenever you are start started getting headache, you cannot concentrate. You cannot do your activities. You get disturbed. Your functions are affected. But you cannot locate the disease exactly where the disease is. Because in the MRI, nothing is found. No material disease. Again, the patient was treated with some medicines for course for months and he consumes the medicine and he goes on and goes on. But what has happened earlier, the disease, the headache was once in a month. Later on, it started getting once in 15 days. Then it started getting it once in a week. Then it started getting it daily. Now the state has developed after two years that he is continuously having headache. Now he returns to the he again goes to the um, doctor, neurologist. He says, we'll do one more MRI. See, again the MRI was done. And now, in this MRI, there is a lesion pathology which, which is found. See, what, are, what is the preceding symptom? What are the preceding symptoms? There was a continuous headache for two years. It was first functional symptom ultimately converted into the pathology. It takes uh, two years to develop a pathology. The same thing, functional symptoms precede the structural change. In similar manner, the functional functions create the organ. Both laws go hand in hand. They are corollaries to each other. And that's why our law that functional symptoms always precede the structural change means behind any pathology, there is always, always, always a preceding functional symptom. Pathology is the end result of the disease. If you are able to understand this, you will understand any pathology is the end product that is not original disease. Disease is inside, in the dynamics, which is expressing in the preceding symptoms. And those, those symptoms are very important to find it out, right remedy. Structural change will not going to give a perfect remedy. So preceding symptoms always defines the remedy very clearly. So if the patient of any pathology comes to you, at that time, you cannot just mean if there are functional symptoms present over there, then those are very essential for you. If you get a brain tumor, you cannot reach to the remedy. Brain tumor is the result of disease, end product of the disease. Original is the preceding, original are the preceding symptoms. You have to catch those preceding symptoms with which you can find it out a remedy. So he is explaining every law in relation with the uh, homeopathy. And then to conclude this part, he, he has explained one more word. Now the law of use governing the homeopathic remedy must therefore be the dose and quantity that will thoroughly permeate the organism and make its essential impress upon vital force is that which will affect the functional sphere of the individual. So, same is true when you prove the remedy. Your remedies, homeopathic remedies, are the remedies which are given in the dynamic doses. You prove a belladonna in 200, belladonna in 30, belladonna in 1M, or if you prove a calcarea cup, you will prove it in 200, 1M, 2. If you are proving these remedies in dynamic doses and give it to the prover for the proving, 
it affects only the functional sphere. Nothing material enters inside your body. So the, it creates only the functional symptom. So the way the functional symptoms comes in natural disease, in the similar manner, the functional symptoms developed in medicinal disease, which is during the proving. And that's why both um, natural disease and medicinal symptom, disease are the products of the disturbance of same vital force. One is from natural source, another is from artificial. Both manifest their manifestations externally in the form of functional symptom. That's why our remedies works very perfectly because this is its dynamic. The natural disease is dynamic. The artificial disease is dynamic. Both expresses through signs and symptoms. If they are close to each other, if they are similar, the nat nature's law of cure work, a weaker dynamic affection is permanently extinguished by the stronger one. The latter, while differing in kind, is very similar to form. So see how he is explaining everything. He is trying to explain the scientificity of the homeopathic laws. Every law, how it is derived from the nature's law or fundamental laws, laws of science. And that's why our principles are the fundamental principles. So we'll stop over here. We'll con continue with this tomorrow. This is a good chapter which defines many laws. I think we'll require two more lectures to complete this chapter. So tomorrow we'll meet at the same time. Thank you. And today evening we'll learn at 8.15, a very nice remedy, very important constitutional remedy, the graphitis. Graphitis is a wonderful remedy. We have to understand it from the source, basics, and so that we can learn about graphitis in today's session with cases. So thank you being there. We'll meet again at 8.15. Good evening. Thank you, sir. Have a good evening.